Okay, this video is how to talk to a medical student. Now, rule number one of talking to medical students is be nice to them. They're kind of shy, they're nice, they're embarrassed, and the real truth is they don't know anything. And that's really what's embarrassing. So go slow and be gentle, okay? Why is it that a medical student in their third or fourth year typically doesn't know anything? <laughs> And the reason, there's a couple reasons. First one is in college, they studied a bunch of stuff that's completely irrelevant to health. Things like calculus, physics, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, statistics, most of the way organic chemistry is taught, it's all irrelevant to health. And that's why they can go to school all these years and be a good student and still not know anything about health, not know anything about nutrition, toxicology, etc. Also, you know, these are students also, I'll often get sent students in their third year, fourth year of medical school. Sometimes I'll get sent, you know, first year students. I get sent students of all kinds of ages. Um, not that often. I actually, you know, wish I did more teaching. I don't do that much teaching. And people's, you know, different families and friends I know will send their kids to talk to me. Okay, so the reason is in med school, you're basically being trained to be an internist, to prescribe drugs. The way internal medicine training is done in a medical school and even in most residencies match the ill to the pill and send a bill and basically nobody knows what causes all these diseases just try to slow it down a little with a pill that's sort of the overall philosophy um, in the old days they used to send uh, I used to do a lot more surgeries a lot more procedures I was an imaging guided surgeon in a sense interventional radiologist it's called um, I did many many thousands of procedures I still do some but I'm by myself most of the time when I do procedures um, so the point is, though, in the past when I would do a procedure, I would just, you know, for fun, I'd ask them, how does prep work? And, and I've never seen a medical student know how the, the prep works, either iodine or chloroprep. And the point being is they'll have memorized the 10th manifestation of some rare disease they'll never see in their life, but they don't know the simplest, most obvious things. It works by drying out, by desiccation. So you always prep first before you prepare the rest of the, rest of the equipment tray for the procedure. Um, after prepping the patient, I'll ask them questions like, you know, where did I learn how to prep like that? And they'll usually say, oh, during your surgery rotation? They go, no, you know, of course, in prep school. So those are just joking around. What are the two types of polocaine, local anesthetic, horse polocaine, water polocaine? All of that's just kidding around. You know, if um, two biopsy specimens are standard, what do you call a third biopsy specimen? If two core biopsies are standard, what do you call a third core specimen, an encore? Okay, so all that's just silliness, but getting back uh, now to a more intelligent conversation. Typical thing will be, I'll joke with a medical student uh, when they first come to meet me. You know, they'll get introduced to me, and I'll say, okay, I'm gonna bet you that I can teach you more in whatever I'm gonna have them around me for, you know, one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. I'll say, I can teach you more in one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it's gonna be, than you learned in the last six years. And they get a big smile on their face and they have a look of disbelief. <clears throat> and so then I say to them, well, look, your parents have invested a lot in you. And so far, it's really been mostly a waste of money. You don't know anything and you're not able to help them, okay? So I ask them, I go, what's the most likely way you could save your father? And of course they don't know, but the correct answer is they can learn how to prevent coronary artery disease. The most common reason men die prematurely is coronary artery disease with a subsequent myocardial infarction. So, <clears throat> you know, I explained to them about the Esselstyn diet and about the benefit of keeping a total cholesterol below 150. Um, and so if they have any questions, we'll go a little more into that detail, but that's the big secret. It's not rocket science. That's what prevents coronary artery events, and it's very preventable. I said, so now tonight you call your father and you tell him about that. And then the next thing I say, what's the most likely way you could save your mother's life? And so the answer is, you want to prevent breast cancer. You know, breast cancer in general, but breast cancer in particular, and it's easy to dramatically decrease one's risk. So I go through the whole thing about deodorant, the whole thing about water filtration, about avoiding meat. Um, I got separate videos on all that, but just the point is that's useful information. So I tell them too. You call your mother tonight and you tell her that. Okay. Then I tell them, you know, the sad truth. I say, well, what percentage of your patients will benefit from this knowledge? And they don't know. And, I, and of course, I tell them it's less than five percent. Five percent if you're lucky. Most patients don't want to change their diet. You know, when I first learned about all this nutritional stuff, I was excited. I'm going, gee, I'm going to be rich. I'll cure all these patients. I'll save their life. I'll take them out of their misery and their suffering, all the awful things I see them go through. But then the reality is they're just too lazy and stupid and ignorant and incurious and illiterate. And 
Hardly any patients want to change their diet. I was kind of amazed by that. When you see these people on the internet, they're usually smart, motivated people uh, who recognize their situation, their, their dire straits, okay? But the average person I run into who's fat and sick is clueless, okay? Or just doesn't have the willpower, the curiosity to bounce out of their situation. Most of the fat people I know uh, that I've known for 20, 30 years, they're still fat and they just progressively get sicker and sicker and sicker. Okay, but you know, for the ones that have the intellectual energy and personal you know, motivation, they often dramatically cure all their problems. Okay, so I also say to the students, you know, it's worth knowing this stuff, even though most patients won't respond to it. You can help yourself, your family, your friends, and you know, the, the few patients that actually are interested in learning about this and willing to change their diet and their lifestyle. Yeah, most patients also, they, they either say, I don't want to stop eating meat, or they say, you know, they think diet's a joke, they give you a funny look, or they look at you like you're being weird. Okay, they're just used to being told, here's your medication, here's the surgery uh, we're planning for you. Okay, so anyways, even if you don't get paid for this knowledge, it's good to have it. And a lot of times it, it carries over to other situations. For example, you know, we're constantly dealing with people who've got a wound that won't heal, you know, like a diabetic foot that won't heal or some other wound in the body. Knowing how to improve blood flow is the fastest way to get a fracture to heal better, to get a wound to heal better. Okay, so continuing on with the conversation with the medical student. I'll ask him then, I go, what super common syndrome, very common, uh, causes appendicitis, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, colon cancer, varicose veins, hemorrhoids, varicocele, gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophageal carcinoma, and is associated with gallstones, acute cholecystitis. It's actually associated with ischemic spine degenerative disc disease, etc., cetera, um, and atherosclerosis. And they never know the answer. And I say it's abdominal pressure syndrome. I go, have you ever heard of that? And they always go, well, maybe. They know abdominal compartment syndrome, which is a totally different thing. But no, I've never met a single one ever. I've never met a resident who's heard of abdominal pressure syndrome. I've actually never met an attending who's heard of abdominal pressure syndrome before they talk to me, despite the fact Dennis Burke had described it in the 1960s. And it's super common. It's like one of the most common things in medicine. It's, it's as common as uh, just about as common as diabetes. I mean, not a day goes by that I don't see a whole bunch of abdominal pressure syndrome. All right. So why does, oh, I should, I should actually make a video about abdominal pressure syndrome. I meant to do that. Make a note to myself, abdominal pressure syndrome, make a video about that. All right. Now, why does meat increase the risk of cancer? I'll ask them that, and they'll usually give me about one or two reasons, kind of hesitantly. They're not sure, but there, you know, there's over 30 reasons why meat increases the risk of cancer. And I'd say the most important one to get from the get-go is just know there's a different amino acid composition in meat in comparison with plant foods. You know, more lysine, leucine, methionine, for example, and it can cause hypoxia because it's high fat, etc. So the high fat hypoxia is a tumor initiator. The amino acid characteristics are tumor promoters. Okay, I'll ask them, how does asbestos cause cancer? They'll never know any of this stuff. What's the Farberg effect? Why does hypoxia cause cancer? What essentially has a cancer cell been transformed into? What enzymes change in a cancer cell? Um, and, you know, of course, they don't, they never answer a single question right. By the way, I've never seen any medical student answer a single one of these questions right, except one medical student who was going into OB-GYN one time answered one of the questions correct about estrogen chemistry. Other than that, I've never seen a, a medical student answer a single question correctly. None, never. And these are all the most common things to know about the most common diseases. They never know any of that stuff. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have to be, admit, when I was a medical student, I didn't either, you know. And it's not because they didn't study. It's just because it's not taught to them. Okay, so anyways, what causes diabetes? They don't know. How does fat get into skeletal muscle cell? Don't know. What happens with mitochondria? Don't know. What are the other biochemistry changes in uh, diabetes? Don't know. What causes advanced glycation end products? Don't know. Okay, so then I'll ask them what causes dementia. They'll go, I don't know, but isn't it most commonly Alzheimer's? And then they really don't know anything about Alzheimer's and also how bogus and overrated Alzheimer's is. They never, ever, none of their residents, none of their attendings even knows mouse equivalents, neurovascular uncoupling, cytotoxicity, apoptosis. They don't know any of this stuff. Okay, so anyways, however many hours they're, they're hanging around me, the time's up. And so I'll ask them. I said, okay, now, be honest. I say, did you learn more today about helping people than you have in the last six years? And they just give a big smile. They don't want to admit it. And I'll say, no, really. Did you learn more today, these last couple of hours, than you did in the last six or seven years about how to help people? So they get this bigger smile. They know it's true, but they don't want to admit it. Then they say, thank you. I really learned a lot. And then they go away. So anyways, 
That's a conversation with a medical student.